Recreational duck hunting is a traditional cultural pastime that attracts visitors to regional Australia, supporting local businesses and the economy. For many hunters, it's their chance to enjoy some of the most beautiful parts of the country and share quality time in the company of friends and family. Duck hunting creates an incentive to conserve and protect wetlands and waterways, and hunters spend countless hours restoring wetlands and controlling pest animals. The value placed on waterfowl and their habitat ensures their conservation and the long-term viability of duck hunting. Recreational duck hunting is a significant economic contributor. Game hunting generates hundreds of millions of dollars in economic activity and annually creates thousands of jobs across Australia. Every duck hunter is an ambassador. The future of hunting depends on how you conduct yourself and the example you set for other duck hunters in the field. It is every hunter's responsibility to respect all animals, the environment, other people and the hunt itself. All duck hunters must ensure they can recognise game birds correctly and avoid taking protected species. Good hunters practise regularly, know how their equipment performs and only hunt within their shooting skills distance. Law-abiding hunters know the regulations and obey them at all times. Our laws are there to ensure duck hunting occurs in a safe, sustainable and humane manner. This will ensure the tradition of duck hunting continues for future generations. It's vital that all hunters are aware of varying state and territory laws before heading out to hunt ducks. The range of duck species declared as game varies between states and territories. If you're ever unsure about which species you can hunt or the hunting season arrangements, contact your local game management authority for advice. Hunting's future depends on you. Show respect and hunt responsibly. Identifying water birds may seem difficult for new hunters, but an experienced hunter can differentiate species in flight with just a glimpse. Learning to identify water birds is a serious but satisfying challenge that is critical to becoming a law-abiding, responsible hunter. While it is essential you learn which duck species you can legally hunt, it's also a great opportunity to get out and enjoy wetlands and other water birds. Start by getting a pair of binoculars and watching ducks in the wild. Compare them to pictures in field guides, such as books or phone apps, or to the footage included here. Once you know what species you're observing, pay attention to its shape, size, coloration, behaviour, calls and flight characteristics. These are features you'll need to be able to recognise when hunting in a range of different environmental and light conditions. Spending time with other experienced duck hunters and bird watchers is the quickest way to identify and learn about water birds. The best duck hunters understand their game intimately and are experts in game identification, behaviour and their habitats. From paddock to plate, the best hunters take the greatest care in harvesting, preparing and serving their signature dish. Only certain species of duck are declared to be game birds. These are the only ducks you are allowed to hunt and only during the hunting season. It is illegal to take threatened and protected species like freckled duck and grebes. And just because a species is threatened does not mean you won't encounter it when hunting. Blue-billed duck and freckled duck are both threatened in Victoria and other states. 
These species can occasionally occur in large numbers on any wetland. It's important you can identify non-game species such as freckled duck, coots, grebes, black swans, spoonbills, purple swamp hens, and black wing stilts, just to list a few. It's vital you spend time learning to recognise non-game species. You must never shoot at anything unless you are sure it is a game duck. Fortunately, all ducks you encounter are quite distinctive, even in flight. You need to develop a snapshot in your mind that lets you instantly recognise the bird based on what it looks like overall. The following footage will introduce you to each species, illustrating the range of characteristics used to identify them, from size, colour, flight and shape, to calls, habitat and behaviour. Now let's focus on game duck species. Pacific black ducks are common throughout most of Australia and can be found in almost any wetland habitat, including open and cumbungi-filled wetlands, rivers, creeks and farm dams. Males and females look very similar. Their body plumage is dark brown, contrasting with a tan-coloured head and dark skull cap. Close up, the feathers appear pale-edged and the face is tan-coloured with a thick black eye stripe. The Pacific black duck has a number of calls. The most recognisable is a rapid succession of quacks, declining in pitch and increasing in tempo. It is a commonly heard sound on our wetlands and should be familiar to most hunters. In profile, Pacific black ducks are heavy bodied, with a head held high on a slender neck and a long, robust, slate grey coloured bill. When disturbed, Pacific black ducks will explode off the water, lifting vertically at first before achieving level flight. Being one of Australia's largest ducks, they are strong flyers with quick, regular and forceful wing beats. They don't tend to twist and turn like other species. In reasonable light, the large white underwing patches contrast strongly with the dark body. The dark upper wing has a green or purple wing patch which can be seen in good light. Pacific black ducks are a distinct species, easily differentiated from other Australian ducks. In flight, look for their heavy build, regular and purposeful wing beats. Even in moderate visibility conditions, this, combined with white underwings and contrasting tan-coloured head, are distinct characteristics. Grey teal are one of our most widespread ducks, found all the way from coastal estuaries to highland lakes. They most commonly occur in tree-lined billabongs, lagoons and floodwaters. They can congregate in huge numbers after favourable breeding seasons, 
and regularly occur in mixed flocks with other species. Males and females are almost identical. Their overall colour is mottled grey-brown with a red eye and slate grey bill. From a distance, the skull cap and feathering above the eye line is clearly offset by the paler face and throat. This is more obvious than in the very similar female or immature male chestnut teal. Chestnut teal tend to be more brown than grey, as well as being slightly larger. The female grey teal produces a laughing call that's well known to hunters. Males, by contrast, produce a high-pitched peep. Grey teal are a small duck with a thin neck. In flight, the large head stands out with its steep forehead and square crown. The wings are pointed, moderately long and broad and designed for manoeuvrability but the tail is short and rounded, so the overall impression is a duck of compact but slender build. Grey teal fly quickly and erratically, often in loose flock formations. In flight, the upper wings have an obvious white patch in the middle fringed by a green or purple coloured patch, depending on the angle of the sun. The underwings also have triangular white patches close to the body. The small white patches above and below the wings of grey teal are easily seen on flying birds, even at great distances and in poor light. you should also learn to recognise the species' distinct head shape and flying style. These combinations of characters should enable hunters to confidently identify grey teal. Chestnut teal are abundant throughout southern Australia, commonly found near the coast in brackish coastal lagoons and saltwater estuaries and inlets, though they can be found inland from time to time. Males are unique in having a dark green, almost black head and neck that shines bright metallic green in sunlight. The flanks and breast are chestnut coloured. Males have a very conspicuous white thigh patch that is visible even at long range. The tail and undertail feathering are black. Females and immature males are very similar to grey teal, though slightly larger and more brownish in colour and lack the pale face and throat. As with grey teal, the female chestnut teal utters a laughing call and the male a high-pitched whistle. Chestnut teal are a small duck with a thin neck and a big head with a square crown. In flight they have the same upper wing pattern as grey teal, sporting a triangular wedge of white. The trailing bottle green feather patch may also flash visibly in the right light. The underwing also has an obvious white patch near the body. 
Chestnut teal are small ducks with moderately long but broad wings designed for fast, twisting flight in among vegetation and to escape predators. Although chestnut teal occur in more coastal and saline habitats, they commonly occur in mixed flocks with grey teal in coastal regions and will wander inland in large numbers. While male chestnut teal are simple enough to identify, females and immature males are very similar to grey teal. In flight, unless they are males, they can be hard to tell apart. Even when they are in mixed flocks, chestnut teal will tend to pair up. So a brown bird near a full plumage male chestnut teal will almost certainly be a female chestnut teal. With practice, you will get used to differentiating between the brown plumage female chestnut teal and grey teal. In particular, look for the more uniform brown head of the female chestnut teal compared to the grey teal that has a more distinct darker grey cap which is clearly separated from its paler grey face and throat. Hardhead are widely distributed throughout Australia, but are most common in southeast Australia and often occur in Tasmania. They are a diving duck, so they tend to prefer deep, permanent freshwater swamps. They will often congregate in flocks near the middle of water bodies. Males are unmistakable. They have deep brown bodies and chocolate brown heads a bright white eye and white undertail. The bill is black with a wide light grey strap across the tip. Females are similar but their plumage is more subdued and the eye is dark. Even from a distance, hardhead have a distinct profile that is different to all other Australian ducks. They sit low in the water, often with the tail held flat against the surface. This slim shape makes their triangular head look disproportionately large. Hardhead will often take off steeply, uttering a hoarse, rasping quack. In flight, they are strong and fast with relatively long, slender wings set well back on the body. Their trademark white band on belly and pure white underwings are important features to look for. The hardhead is the only Australian duck with a broad, solid and conspicuous white band across its entire upper wing. Even at distance, the impression is of a large dark duck with long white wing bands. These features make hardhead unmistakable and one of the easiest ducks to identify in flight, even in poor light. Pink-eared ducks 
are widely distributed throughout inland southeastern and southwestern Australia. They prefer shallow, temporary wetlands where they breed in waters left by floods. Following both favourable breeding seasons and during drought, they disperse and form large flocks on extensive open wetlands. This is one of Australia's smallest and most unique looking ducks. Males and females are similar, with zebra striped chest and flank feathering. The small pink feathers around the ear can only be seen when you're close. But the chocolate brown eye patch and the contrasting white face can be seen a long way off. The pink-eared duck's most obvious feature is its large, square bill that's longer than the head and separated by a conspicuous pure white facial crescent. The bill is designed for sifting microscopic plants and animals and has evolved unique leathery flaps on its outer corners. In profile, the bird has a front-heavy appearance exacerbated by the bird's small body and stumpy tail. On water, the tail looks squared off, the body is rectangular, and the head held up with the heavy bill hanging at a slight downward angle. Pink-eared ducks have short, rounded wings, an adaptation for a fast, twisting flight. In flocks, they move in tight formation, and are known for circling wetlands reluctant to leave. Their constant chirruping call is a key distinguishing feature. In flight, their intricate patterning appears obvious. They have a narrow but obvious white trailing edge to the wings and white underwing feathers. Pink-eared ducks are easy to identify even if you can't see the head, as the base of the tail is ringed white. This is unique among Australian ducks and immediately obvious when birds are flying away. Pink-eared ducks are unmistakable and instantly recognisable by their small size, short rounded wings, very short tail and long bill. Australasian or blue-winged shovelers are sparsely distributed and nomadic throughout southern Australia. They prefer to congregate at permanent, well-vegetated freshwater or saline wetlands with areas of open water. The large, shovel-shaped bill that gives the bird its name finishes flush with the top of the head making it wedge-shaped in appearance. Male and female shovelers have different plumage. In breeding condition, males have a shiny blue-green head, a white crescent in front of a yellow eye, and chestnut flanks and belly. These features are less prominent outside the breeding season. The female lacks this colourful plumage, being predominantly brown with a fawn-coloured belly. Shovelers fly quickly, erratically and often in tight formation. A relatively short tail, compared to their long bill and head, gives them a front-heavy appearance, which is similar to a pink-eared duck, though they are much smaller with rounder wings. 
At reasonably close range, you may notice the square-ended bill of an Australasian shoveler, even in flight. In good light, you'll see both male and female shovelers have smoky blue upper wing feathers, fringed by a flash of white and brilliant green feathers. These features are less obvious in females and non-breeding males. Beneath the wing, the lead front feathers are white, contrasting with darker rear feathers and belly, similar to a Pacific black duck. The Australasian shoveler is the only native Australian duck with orange legs, which they reveal as they pitch down to land. Most of the time, you will be identifying shovelers in flight against the sky. This is best done by learning to recognise their unique shape and style of flying. Compare them to other species, such as these grey teal. They have similar white wing flashes, but an unusual duck profile. Look for the fast, erratic flight style and flight profile of shovelers, their contrasting white underwing feathers and orange legs. Australian wood ducks are found throughout much of Australia. Their favoured habitats are well-timbered creeks, rivers and farmland pasture and dams. They are common in parks and gardens in urban areas. They have brown heads, short neck and a goose-like bill they use for grazing. Wood duck are often seen walking on the edge of water bodies or in pasture. Males have a black belly and undertail, mottled grey flanks and belly, and spotted chest. A raised crest at the back of the male's head gives the bird its other common name, maned duck. Females are similar to males with a paler head and two white stripes on the face. They lack the black belly. Wood duck have a distinctive meowing call that should be familiar to most hunters. They are wary of humans and when alerted to danger will often raise their head and either walk away or take flight. In flight, they are heavy with slow wing beats. The neck and head appear comparatively short. Their wing pattern in flight is unlike any other Australian duck, with prominent white patches on black tipped wings. The upper wing is an unmistakable pattern, consisting of a white patch with a dark bar across it. The underwings are almost entirely white with dark tips. When identifying Australian wood duck, it helps to recall their distinct shape, broad wings and short neck. The white patch with the dark bar across it is very obvious especially when they are flying away.
Australian shell duck or mountain duck are found throughout southeastern and southwestern Australia. They inhabit lowland wetlands close to pasture, where they often graze and are often found near farm dams and open water. The Australian shell duck is the largest Australian duck, the size of a small goose, and is easily recognised. Males have a black belly and chestnut orange breast, black head and neck, and a white collar. Females are similar, except for some white face markings and white ring around the eye. In flight, they will utter a distinct honking call, unlike any other duck. Being a large heavy duck, their flight is laboured, with strong and slow wing beats. On long flights, they will often form V formations, or follow each other in long, straight lines. When landing, they'll often drop out of the sky rapidly. The dark wings and body contrast sharply with brilliant white wing patches and even in poor light, the chestnut, black and white coloration is distinct. When the birds are approaching, the white patches on the leading edge of their wings are like landing lights on an aircraft. On size alone, Australian shell duck are very unlikely to be confused with any other duck. The following ducks are protected in Victoria. Along with Cape Barren Goose and Magpie Goose, they are non-game species and must not be hunted. The freckled duck is one of our largest ducks, occurring in southeastern and southwestern Australia, extending into central Australia. Freckled duck prefer densely vegetated swamps with lignum and cane grass. After favourable breeding seasons, they will redistribute widely, occurring in temporarily flooded areas, creeks and farm dams, often in open water. Despite periods of local abundance, this rare species will seek refuge away from inland Australia after periods of drought. Because of this, it is one of the most important ducks to learn to identify. Freckled ducks have few discernible field marks. They take off from a running start, slowly gaining level flight, often circling a wetland to do so. They are unusual for an Australian duck in having a very long neck, elongated head, and a long, scooped bill shaped like a ski jump. This gives them a slender appearance, but also makes them appear pot-bellied, as their weight is distributed back towards the tail. Despite being a similar size to our Pacific black duck, they are different, lacking the tan head and prominent white underwings. They are also sometimes said to be similar to hardhead, but lack the white upper wing wingband of this species. The wings of freckled ducks are long, thin and triangular, and on slow but powerful wing beats, the wingtips bend. The rectangular head is held low, giving them a hunchbacked appearance, and the tail is pointed, long and tapered, with the legs slung far back on the body. 
except at close range, the plumage appears brown, with a dark head and neck, brown grey coloured back and upper wings, and paler underwing and belly. In some circumstances, the belly and underwing may appear almost white, similar to Pacific black duck and other game birds. On closer inspection, the feathers are peppered brown and white. On the water, they fold their neck into their chest feathers and can appear quite compact. The head is distinct, with its upturned bill and tufted crest. Freckled ducks are recognisable due to a combination of their larger size and triangular pointed head. In breeding plumage, male freckled ducks have a bright red base to their bill. Females and immature males are more dull in coloration, slightly browner with a more uniformly coloured bill. They tend to be quite wary and silent. When they do call, it's a relatively quiet, rasping quack. Freckled duck can occur on any wetland and will often mix with game species. It is particularly important that you learn to identify this protected species as they will tend to fly low around a wetland and can be mistaken for game ducks. As with most ducks, the best way to identify a freckled duck is not to look for specific markings, but learn what they look like in flight. Freckled ducks fly with their head down, have a hunched appearance and lack any colour on the upper wing. Freckled ducks are large and slim birds. Their long, slender neck, head and bill, long wings and long tapering tail are key features to look for. Blue-billed ducks are a freshwater species found only in southeast, southwest Australia and parts of Tasmania. In breeding condition, males have a big, heavy, bright blue bill, black head and rust-coloured breast and flanks. Non-breeding birds are more drab. Females are completely different being dark grey all over, with fine mottled barring. They often swim with their tail either held vertically or laid flat, invisible against the water's surface. When swimming, they semi-submerge their body, so their head appears disproportionately large. Bluebills are a diving duck, preferring to inhabit deep water lakes and usually occur in pairs or very small flocks. During breeding, they inhabit small water bodies fringed with heavy vegetation. When disturbed, they will usually dive and rarely fly. They are generally silent, except for an occasional soft barking call. If provoked to fly, blue ducks will first take to the air by running along the surface, gathering speed before liftoff. They land with an awkward tumbling motion. They have short wings, moderately long neck and trailing legs. Because of this and their similar size, they are easy to confuse with Eurasian coot also a non-game species. The flight of a blue-billed duck is level, direct and extremely fast on very rapid wing beats. Blue-billed ducks are normally quite conspicuous in open water. The small size, cocked tail, heavy bill 
and habit of diving should be enough to find and identify them. Even when disturbed, bluebill ducks may not fly and will usually prefer to dive. If they do decide to fly, they will take off running. In that case, the best way to identify them is to remember they have no distinct wing pattern, they have proportionately long head and legs, and they fly extremely fast, direct and level. Musk duck are widely distributed in southern and western Australia and Tasmania. They usually prefer deep, sheltered, permanent freshwater lakes and swamps, but sometimes occur on saline wetlands, tidal estuaries and bays. Musk ducks are a large, uniquely shaped duck, dark grey all over with a robust conical shaped bill and spiny tail feathers that are often held vertically. Adult males sport a large lobe of skin under the bill. This contains a musk gland that gives the bird its name. It is unlikely you will ever see a musk duck fly. They are very wary birds and float low in the water, diving when disturbed. Plumed whistling ducks are found mainly in the northern half of Australia, but often find their way to southern states. They often move around in large groups and spend the day camped at the edges of farm dams or water holes, commuting to and from pasture in the morning and evenings. Plumed whistling ducks have long, erect, cream-coloured plumes on each flank. Their overall colour is grey, with orange and black barring on the shoulders, pink legs and a black and pink bill. In flight, plumed whistling ducks are evenly coloured, with dark but faintly barred underwings. They have a hunched appearance and the pink legs trail behind. The short, rounded wings beat slowly and the loud whistling calls give them away. They are about the size of Pacific black ducks, but more slender looking with a white belly and undertail feathers. Unlike Pacific black duck, they have no white underwing. The pale plumes are noticeable, even in flight although they are folded back against the thighs. When identifying plumed whistling ducks, look for the pale brown body with distinct erect cream coloured flank plumes. In flight, the unpatterned wings, loud whistling calls and hunched appearance should be sufficient to identify this species.
Many of the birds you see on wetlands are not ducks and must not, under any circumstances, be hunted. Here is an introduction to some of the common non-game species you will encounter when duck hunting. Black swans are abundant on wetlands throughout Australia. Such a distinctive swan cannot be mistaken for a game bird. The long neck is obvious on the water and in the air. The red bill with a white stripe is another important feature absent in any game bird. In the air, black swans fly with the neck fully outstretched, revealing white-tipped wings clearly visible from a great distance. Black swans graze on submerged weed in shallow water or on grass in pastures close to water. The Eurasian coot is found all over Australia and is sometimes mistaken for a duck. The difference is they are charcoal grey to black colour, with a white beak that continues over the head to form a shield. In flight, their legs trail behind, and in proportion, they can look similar to male blue-billed ducks, which also have a brightly coloured bill. Coots often occur in flocks, mixing freely with other waterfowl, and they dive for food. When disturbed, they patter over the water with rapid wing beats, usually keeping low to the surface, but they may fly overhead. Purple swamp hens are bright blue with a huge triangular red beak and massive unwebbed red legs. Purple swamp hens are common around the edges of wetlands, especially where there is dense, tall vegetation, such as kumbungi. This is an abundant species that flies slowly, with periods of gliding on very broad wings, legs hanging down and trailing behind the body. Purple swamp hens cannot be confused with game birds and must not be hunted. You may encounter black twing stilts, red-necked avocets and banded stilts when out duck hunting. These elegant shorebirds are very different to ducks. They are black and white in colour and have long, delicate bills used to probe mud or sift water for invertebrates. black wing stilts have disproportionately long red legs that trail behind the tail in flight. Red-necked avocets are similar in colour, but with a reddish head and a long, upward-curved bill. These species breed on inland salt lakes, but are also found on flooded fields, wetland edges and mudflats. There are three species of grebe in Australia, none of which are game birds. The hoary-headed grebe is found in freshwater and coastal environments, while the Australasian grebe is a freshwater bird, often found on very small ponds. These two species are tiny, with wedge-shaped bills and short, fluffy tails. They should not be confused with similarly coloured small game ducks such as grey teal. When alarmed, these grebes will dive, or they will patter along the surface and fly short distances very low to the water. In contrast, the great crested grebe is larger and flies strongly, fast and direct. 
Most game birds take flight strongly and vertically. Any bird that takes flight by running along the water surface is almost certainly not a game bird. The most common cormorants of inland waters are little black cormorants and little pied cormorants. Cormorants are fish eaters. These little black cormorants are all black with a long slender neck and hooked bill. They often occur in close-knit flocks feeding together. The great cormorant is larger, goose-sized with a distinct yellow face. While the little pied cormorant is much smaller and coloured black and white. All cormorants have black wings with no wing pattern at all. This makes them different to any game bird species. In flight, their long tail feathers help to distinguish them from game ducks. Ibis are large water birds with thick, down-curved bills used to probe mud and soil. The two most common species are the straw-necked ibis and Australian white ibis. Their long bills and large size ensures they cannot be confused with any game bird. Also common in wetlands are herons, egrets and spoonbills, all of which have relatively long necks and most are white in colour. The royal spoonbill has a black face and bill, while the yellow-billed spoonbill is pale. Both species use the strangely shaped bill to sift for invertebrates. Great egret, little egret and white-faced heron are other long-necked species that are commonly encountered in wetlands throughout Australia and must not be shot. Recreational game and pest animal hunting is growing in popularity throughout Australia. Hunters have a responsibility to treat firearms with respect and to handle them safely at all times. This chapter identifies 10 basic rules that are fundamental to safe recreational duck hunting. Treat every firearm as being loaded. Do not take anyone's word that a shotgun is unloaded. Always check it yourself. Only pass or accept a shotgun that has the muzzle pointed in a safe direction has the action open and is not loaded. Keep your finger off the trigger and keep clear of the muzzle. If you're unsure how to open a shotgun, leave it alone and ask the owner to show you it is empty. Always point firearms in a safe direction. Regardless of whether a shotgun is loaded or not, always keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. Never point a firearm at anyone. Shotguns should never be lent against vehicles or any place where they could slide and fall, accidentally discharging. Always be particularly careful when placing shotguns in or removing them from vehicles, boats or storage. The muzzle should be pointed away from yourself or anyone else nearby and your finger should be off the trigger. Load a firearm only when ready to fire. Only load a shotgun when you intend to use it, and only in an area where it can be safely and legally discharged. Remember to unload it when you have used it. When in position, load the open gun and apply the safety catch. When you acquire your target, release the safety catch, close the gun and shoot. If you have closed the gun and then decide not to shoot,
reapply the safety catch and break the gun. You should always be careful when using the safety catch. As with all mechanical devices, they are subject to wear and tear and can malfunction. Identify your target beyond all doubt. You must positively identify your target beyond all doubt before firing. Make absolutely certain that the movement, colour, sound and shape of your target is identified correctly. Always identify the whole animal before shooting and never shoot at only movement, colour, sound or shape. Remember, if in doubt, don't shoot. Check your firing zone. Be aware of what is between you and your target, as well as what is beyond your target. When firing a shotgun, be aware that the spread of shot may endanger something other than the target. The shot pattern from a shotgun is very wide, especially at longer ranges. Your firing zone changes rapidly when you follow a moving target with a shotgun. As you swing the muzzle of your shotgun around in an arc, be aware of the position of other hunters. Make sure they are not caught in the path between your firearm and the target or beyond the target. When sharing a hide, duck hunters must ensure they avoid an overswing, which could endanger a companion. Store firearms and ammunition safely. By law, you are required to have a safe and secure place to store your firearms. All firearms and ammunition must be stored separately and kept out of the reach of children. When locked away after use, they must be out of view in an approved safe. If the safe weighs less than 150 kilograms when empty, it must be securely fixed to the floor or wall frame. Remember, after returning from a hunt, firearms must be unloaded, cleaned and locked away. Ammunition must immediately be locked away separately to the firearms. Securing firearms out of sight will help prevent theft. Avoid alcohol or drugs when handling firearms. When handling firearms, it is crucial that you are able to think clearly. Never mix alcohol or drugs with firearms. Wait until your shotgun and ammunition have been locked away before you have a drink and never shoot with others who are or have been drinking alcohol or taking drugs. Never have a loaded firearm in the car, home or camp. Before entering a car, home or camp, unload your shotgun. Leave the action of the shotgun open and ensure there is no ammunition in it. Avoid firing at hard surfaces or water. Duck hunters are sometimes required to dispatch down birds by firing a swatter load towards water. This must be done with utmost caution as it could create a ricochet and endanger other people, dogs or equipment. Otherwise, you must always avoid firing at water or hard, flat surfaces. Don't climb fences or obstacles with loaded firearms. Before climbing a fence or obstacle, unload your firearm. Never rely on safety catches as they are only intended to supplement the safe handling of firearms. If alone, unload your firearm, place it through the fence and lay it on the ground with the muzzle pointing in a safe direction. Then climb the fence or obstacle. If laying your firearm down, always check for barrel obstruction. If hunting with another person, hand your unloaded firearm to your hunting partner and then climb the fence or obstacle. Treat every firearm as being loaded. Always point firearms in a safe direction. Load a firearm only when ready to fire. Identify your target beyond all doubt. Check your firing zone. 
store firearms and ammunition safely. Avoid alcohol or drugs when handling firearms. Never have loaded firearms in the car, home or camp. Avoid firing at hard surfaces or water. Don't climb fences or obstacles with loaded firearms. Responsible hunting is about the effective, efficient, safe and sustainable harvesting of a wild resource. The number of recreational hunters is increasing. It is every hunter's obligation to act responsibly and lawfully to protect the future of hunting, the environment, the birds and the interests of other land users. To be a better hunter, you have to work within the limits of your skill, understanding and equipment. No hunter wants to wound or lose a bird. There are three areas of practice that will help you reduce the risk of wounding. Understand your limitations. To be a better hunter, you need to practice regularly. Learn your effective shooting skills distance and be able to estimate this distance. Understand your shotgun and ammunition. To effectively and humanely harvest ducks and to select the right combination of shot shell and choke size, you need to pattern test your shotgun. Good hunting techniques. There are several things you can do in the field to reduce wounding. Don't hunt over heavy cover where you can't retrieve a bird. Use a well-trained gun dog. Don't shoot at flocks or lead birds. Use swatter loads for down birds. Never shoot beyond your effective shooting skills distance. The techniques you're about to see are also detailed in the Shotgunning Education Program Handbook. Practice these techniques and you will become a more effective and efficient hunter. You will help ensure duck hunting can be sustained into the future. Hunters who shoot within their effective shooting skill distance will greatly increase their success and reduce the risk of wounding. To improve and maintain your shooting skills, you need to practice regularly, test your effective shooting skills distance, learn to estimate this distance in the field. You should regularly visit a simulated field or shotgunning range where you can practice shooting accurately. You will need to learn the distances at which you can regularly hit targets moving in different directions. Proper practice involves using clay targets thrown at different distances, angles and flight speeds. This simulates the behaviour of ducks being hunted. There are several configurations of clay target shooting that are useful to practice. They include crossing, left to right and right to left crossing, where the target passes across in front of you. Overhead incoming, where the target passes high and towards you. Overhead outgoing, where the target passes overhead and away. It is essential that you know your effective shooting skills distance. This is the distance at which you can regularly hit a clay target with your first shot, six out of eight times. Shooting birds beyond this distance greatly increases the chance of wounding. The majority of hunters have a maximum effective shooting skills distance of no more than about 30 metres. Once you know your maximum effective shooting skills distance, you need to learn to estimate this distance under field conditions. 
there are a number of techniques for estimating distance. These include electronic rangefinders, distance markers, including natural features like stumps, and decoys set at known distances. The use of decoys is designed to bring birds closer to within your effective shooting skills distance. In the field, you can set decoys at known distances from your hide. Use these as a guide to know when to shoot and when not to shoot. Every shotgun is different. To understand how your shotgun patterns, you do what's known as pattern testing. This allows you to calculate the density of pellets needed to humanely dispatch a duck at your effective shooting skills distance. Before you go hunting, you need to choose the right choke and shot shell combination. This depends on the pattern your shotgun creates, the duck species you are hunting, your effective shooting skills distance. The diameter of your gun's muzzle is called the choke. The tighter the choke, the narrower the spread of pellets. Before you go hunting, you need to understand how your shotgun patterns, so you can choose the right choke and shot shell combination. Before you head out hunting, decide what species you are going to hunt or which species you are likely to encounter. Smaller species require smaller shot sizes, but choke constriction also determines the distance at which you can lethally dispatch a bird. Smaller birds need a denser pattern because they have smaller vital organs. The technique you use to understand how your shotgun distributes shot is called pattern testing. Set up a backing board at your maximum effective shooting skills distance. This is the distance you determined earlier by firing at clay targets. Having decided what species you are going to hunt, check the lethality table and choose a shot shell with the appropriate pellet size. If your firearm permits, you can swap to an appropriate choke size. Fire at the pattern sheet and count the number of pellet strikes within the circle. Repeat this a minimum of three times, then calculate the average. The lethality table is your best reference for working out the minimum pellet count needed to humanely dispatch the ducks you are targeting at your known effective shooting skills distance. If it doesn't achieve the minimum pellet count documented in the lethality table, there are a number of things you can do. First, you can alter shot size. You can increase the payload or weight of shot contained in the shot shell. Try a different brand of ammunition. Try a shot shell with a lower load velocity to avoid blowing out the shot pattern. Try a different brand of choke or choke constriction. Decreasing your shooting distance will also help. There are a number of practices you can adopt while hunting in the field that will help you to be more successful and reduce the risk of wounding birds. Never shoot at flocks, lead birds and going away birds that are beyond 35 metres. Never hunt over heavy cover where you can't retrieve a downed bird. Retrieve downed birds quickly. Use a well-trained gun dog. Use swatter loads. Never shoot beyond your effective shooting skills distance. You should never shoot into a flock of ducks. 
pattern testing has taught you that shotgun pellets spread out to create a lethal pattern. Only two pellets are needed to strike the vital organs. If you fire into a flock, you could wound other birds around the bird you are targeting. You should never shoot at lead birds, because by the time the pellets reach the bird, there is a risk of hitting trailing birds or other birds that have flown into that space. Instead, target birds on their own or to the outside of the flock. You should never take going away shots beyond 35 metres. A going away bird has its vital organs protected by the gizzard and backbone. This reduces pellet penetration and can result in lost birds or wounding. There is no point in shooting at a duck if it can't be retrieved. Hunting ducks over heavy cover, like reed beds, means you are unlikely to find any down birds, even if you are using a well-trained gun dog. If a bird is downed, you must stop hunting immediately and take the necessary measures to retrieve it. Maintain a focus on where the bird was downed and walk a straight line to retrieve it. If you are working over water, you can use a boat or work with another hunter to assist in locating a downed bird. A well-trained gun dog can significantly increase the chance of recovering downed birds. A poorly trained gun dog can disrupt hunters, cause commotion and encourage hunters to take shots outside their effective shooting skills distance. Allow your gun dog to work and don't take another shot until your dog has made the retrieve. A swatter load is a shotgun shell with a large number of small pellets, like a size 6 or 7 load. It is used to dispatch a wounded bird on the water. The rich pattern of a swatter load means you are more likely to strike the vital organs of a downed bird. All hunters using swatter loads should ensure ricocheting pellets do not strike people, dogs or equipment. Hunting is a very different skill to shooting. Duck hunting is a tradition that commands respect for the hunt, for the birds, the environment, the laws and other people. What you've learned about your effective shooting skills distance, using the right choke and shot shell combination for your hunting situation and basic field hunting techniques will make you a better hunter and reduce any chance of wounding. Remember the three areas of practice that will most help you be a better hunter. Understand your limitations. Practice regularly. Know your effective shooting skills distance. Learn to accurately estimate this distance in the field. Understand your shotgun and ammunition. Pattern test your shotgun. Choose the right combination of choke and shot shell for the ducks you are hunting. Good hunting techniques. Never shoot at flocks, lead birds and going away birds that are beyond 35 metres. Never hunt over heavy cover where you can't retrieve a bird. Retrieve down birds quickly. Use a well-trained gun dog. Use swatter loads to dispatch down birds. Never shoot beyond your effective shooting skills distance. As you spend time with other skilled hunters, you will learn a range of other field techniques. You will learn the value of using camouflage, duck callers, hides and decoys. The skills you learn will add to your enjoyment of duck hunting. Game laws are designed to ensure hunting remains safe, sustainable and humane. If you have any questions about hunting, you should contact your state game agency. 
At all times, hunt responsibly and show respect for wildlife, the environment, other people and your fellow hunters. All this will put you on the path to becoming a better hunter. Thank you.